IBM were thinking of launching the 360 series computers that would be byte addressable. In the early 60s, there was a well-known committee that decided the uh, character codes we use today, the ASCII committee. Americans, a standard code for information interchange. Early 60s, IBM approved of it. They even had delegates on the board. So then the embarrassing questions start coming in. Um, OK, so there's these 8-bit characters. Where are they going to come from? They're going to be ASCII, aren't they? And IBM coughed and blushed and spluttered and said, uh, we'll make a statement in due course. And a lot of us saw what was going to come up here. They'd had half a century of evolving their own codes, which were based on BCD, binary coded decimal. More about that possibly later. And they just kind of evolved. The salespeople going bananas at me and said, look, boss, this 360 series, right? If you're saying it can't use our existing codings on our card punch, which we've been using for years, because BCD had become EBSTIC, Extended Binary Coded Decimal Interchange Code, and that was the IBM way. But, said, but look, we had six versions of that for historical reasons. Even now, I don't know if you can get out of IBM that document that shamefacedly owns up to six different versions of EBSTIC. Look it up on Wikipedia. It's hilarious. It really is. So basically, the servant said, look, if we can still use our peripherals with this new machinery, we can ship quickly. If we start messing about saying we will be totally ASCII tested and compliant before we ship, we're going to lose a huge segment, potentially, of our market to our competitors. So why not? Just say, you know where we, you are with IBM. You're not really interested in these technical details. We'll hold your hand. But under the hood, we will carry on using EBSTIC as our characters. And uh, I've no doubt the comments will be full of typical IBM <laughs> attitudes or about this. But you could see that commercially, for them, it made sense. Oh, by the way, Sean, have you noticed? It has an unforeseen side effect, this. It locks people into using IBM machinery forevermore because they'll be utterly non-standard. Everybody else will be using ASCII. Is this a bug or is it a feature? You know, and I do believe and I, I think when we discussed this before, I do believe that even now IBM replacement mainframes will be using EBSTIC inside. But um, did they eventually get the message and come properly into the modern world? Yes, they did. But it took time because um, as far as I know, some of the earliest machines to actually use ASCII that were IBM was when IBM discovered Unix and decided, oh, there's all these servers, Unix, other people doing it. Let's do it the IBM way at great expense. But for our customers who don't mind spending money with us, we'll say, here's the IBM way to do Unix. Well, their AIX, I think it's called servers, do, of course, use ASCII, life would be intolerable for them if it didn't. So in a way, the EBSIDicity of it could be confined to the mainframes and kept behind the IBM wall, as it were. But just occasionally, problems from EBSIDic leapt out into the outside world, sometimes as a result of IBM trying to be helpful. Would you like to have your ASCII-based PDF accidentally or deliberately stored and forwarded by an EBSTIC machine that probably thought it was part of its duty to translate all this rogue ASCII into EBSTIC for internal use and then translate it back into ASCII again on the way out? I remember Jim King of Adobe telling me it was his biggest nightmare for ages was this, you know, IBM trying to be helpful, yeah, <laughs> store and forward EBSTIC based machines. Uh, he said, you know, I tried to discover <clears throat> what the common characters were between ASCII and EBSTIC. How much commonality is there? There's got to be a lot. There must be, what, 100 odd characters which are in different mapped positions, but nevertheless they correspond to one to one. Well, first problem is for C programmers, there's no curly braces in EBSTIC. I don't know how they got around that. I'm guessing some something like use backslash open paren or something for curly braces. I don't know. And uh, anyway, Jim said, 
He said, we finally decided as Adobe there were 80 safe characters that were intermappable between the two. We were wrong. It depends which of the six versions of Epstein you were using. I think in the end they decided there were only 64 absolutely safe characters that could be interconverted between the two. So I think the moral of all this is that, um, of course, increasingly Epstein is now utterly confined to the I guess, replacement hardware, why bother to reprogram it? It was written in COBOL in 1965, it's still working, we just want faster hardware to run it on. Good old IBM, supply what the customers want, just sign here. I mean, I speak as one who's seen a Meg in a box delivered by IBM on a 360, 70 I think it was and uh, a lot of very worthy people were doing very good data processing using COBOL and all this kind of stuff and the thing was so unbelievably slow and two IBM salesmen came buttoned up holding well we here in England only the Chancellor holds up a red box with a budget statement and these guys were holding this box I just happened to be there and I think the manager computer center manager's name was Don the luckless Don was faced with these guys holding this black box and they said, Don, we hear via back channels from your users, they are not happy with the performance of your machine on the, was it called the IAS, their database system? I forget now. Uh, anyway, they're not happy, Don. We have the solution for you. <laughs> What's that? Says the luckless Don, blood draining of his face. Don, it's a Meg in a box. And they took out two things that looked more like television cabling with coaxial plugs on the end, plug them into the Meg in the box and say, open up the CPU case, <laughs> Don. So you know, I'm watching all this happening. And they put these things in there. Okay, regen. I think that's the IBM word, is it? Regen the system. Tell it here. It's got a megabyte more memory. So the regen was done. And honestly, the thing went off like a Lamborghini compared to what it was doing before. And the next thing, almost literally, was a queue of users outside the door. Because, of course, then the IBM salesman depart. Hey, just leave it there. Get, let your users get used to it, you know, and all this. And, <laughs> and the users are outside Don's door in a matter of nanoseconds. What if I said, Don, that memory stays. That memory goes. You die. This machine's wonderful. This is the way it should have been. And of course, the bill was presented for the Meg in a box, but of course, could now be done as a properly supplied unit. But just for now, I think it was something like $10,000. $10,000 for a Mega. But it's IBM memory, Sean. It was so fast. The users were happy. I, I actually saw it in operation. That was the way it worked, you know. Um, You've got a lot of money, you know it makes sense, don't take chances, they won't sack you, Don, for spending $10,000 on a Meg as long as it's with IBM. There we are. So was that all that there was to it? No, on the sidelines, and treated quite honestly and, and shamefacedly, I say this in many ways, with a bit of derision, was commercial computing. And the company, as I'm sure you all know, that was instrumental in leading the way with that was IBM. 